So they, oh, yeah. it started with, I had decided to go to Switzerland and visit Aeronauts, which is the place where Aeronauts began in the 1930s, <clears throat> almost 100 years ago. And I had heard, I think 30 years ago, that you could actually stay there, but I never went. So this year, I was going with a good friend, and it felt like a pilgrimage to see where Aras had began, and actually turned out to be almost the same as it had been since 1930s. <clears throat> so just before I left, uh, Patricia came in and told me about this conference. So I thought, hmm, I have to go to the, the tower, the Bollingen Tower, which I hadn't thought of because it was closed in the summer. So but I thought, I must do that. So I called up the Institute in Switzerland and I said, no, it's closed. But they gave me the name to one of Jung's grandsons, um, Jos Herney, and I called him. And he said, yes, it's closed, I'm going to be there, so you can come, you want to welcome, will you welcome us? <laughs> so that, we decided that was going to be the first place we went to. Um, As I began thinking about <clears throat> the Boiling and Tower, it sort of came to me that it is a place where you created um, a place where he could live fully a symbolic life. So, um, but I will begin from the beginning. So, I, when my friend and I arrived in Switzerland, I said that. Yeah. And so we, we stayed in a little town nearby, and um, we took a taxi. And the taxi driver had never heard of the Bollingen Tower, but they, he left us off on a little street there. And it wasn't even the street, it was a gravel road, and, um, and there was a lake, Jewish, so we thought, okay, we followed the lake and walked on this gravel road. And there were several gates and houses, but finally we came to one, and as we passed by, we saw someone coming out, and that was Joss Parney meet, greeting us. Um, so we walked over the past and up over a field, and there were all these trees, and gradually we saw um, something, the towers, several towers, and, and when we uh, got closer, it looked much more like a castle than a tower. And I, this is what we see. Um, <coughs> it looks like actually like a medieval car castle, um, and it, everything felt so solid and um, almost as if it was coming out of the earth, and not what you think really about the, about the tower that's rising up in the air. It felt like it was being held by the earth and throw out uh, this sense of the stone was present. And that's why I've chosen to use these old black, black and white pictures because they really get, give that sense of stone. Um, it's another picture, but it is also <laughs> close to the water. So it's almost, it's living between land and water. And, um, and it took you 32 years to complete the tower, as you kept calling it, from 1923 to 1955. Jung writes in Memories, Dreams, Reflection. Looking back at the tower, I found that I had, <coughs> I had to achieve a kind of representation in stone of my innermost thoughts of the knowledge I had acquired. That was the beginning of the tower, the house which I built for myself at Bali. <clears throat> he also said that he kind of built, built it in a kind of a dream. Only afterwards did he see how all the parts were coming together into a meaningful form. This is 
the drawing by an architect that came there and, and looked at it, and she made this interesting drawer of the different parts. So I come and describe the different parts as we go along. And um, our host, your Carney, showed us around, and the same feeling followed me, how down to earth everything was, how real and how solid, how timeless, as if nothing had changed since you lived there. And I had this sort of fantasy that he might come around the corner any time. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, outside of this little loja, the little house where uh, at this time Jost and his wife and her friends were playing and the children were playing and they were talking here. Um, this was the last part Jung added to the house, maybe when he had more extroverted perhaps. In contrast, this is the original structure. Um, and you can see how uh, small and few the windows are and how protective it is. On the first floor, there is still the kitchen where nothing has changed since you only lived there. And on the second floor became the living sp space. Jung's original idea had been to build a much more primitive so the structure that he had inspired him when he traveled to Africa. He wanted to have one of those huts with a fire in the, in the middle. But as he explains, the tower became a manifestation of my life and the design kept changing. So when we entered the kitchen, it was very dark and you could only see the light coming in from these few small windows. Um, it seemed to be at the same time a smithy and alchemist workshop as well as a kitchen. There were no, and there are still no, modern uh, uh, appliances. No gas, no electricity, because Jung didn't want to frighten the spirits that lived there. Mm -hmm. um, and of course there was the stove, where the, the, the wood stove where Jung cooked his food and where the pots and pans spoke to him. Uh, and then there was this most amazing staircase. And uh, one of the few images I chose to show, so I show from the kitchen. And it, it, it was very narrow stones, there was no handle, and it sort of followed the wall up like a spiral around the round wall. Um, Well, this image uh, doesn't really show how precarious it actually was in this real life. The kitchen was the only place we were allowed to enter, and we were not allowed to take any photographs anywhere there inside. But the kitchen clearly demonstrated uh, Jung's dream of living a simple life, and as he said, how difficult it is. It also meant living close to nature, and Josh told us how Jung would feed the wild animals, including a snake, and how the animals loved Jung. At one time, a bird started to make a nest in his hair. There is a special connection with the women in Jung's life and the building of the tower. It was after his mother's death in 1932 that Jung first began the building of what for him became a maternal protective tower, like a maternal womb, which allowed him, as he says, to be reborn in stone. But after a few years, Jung felt that the original structure was too primitive and there was also something missing, so he added another tower-like annex, as you can see. 
Syria. And yet, after another period, another four years, he felt still something was missing, and he extended the tower up on the far side. He spent very much uh, of his time with Tony Wolf, especially in that <coughs> um, who often visited <coughs> Bolian. He also wanted a room where he was could be alone, um, but so only he had the key to this room. Yes, we come in, <coughs> they are invited, um, and there he worked, did a lot of writing, and he painted on the walls among others, Philemon was one of the paintings on the wall. And he said that these paintings carried him out of the present into timelessness. It was not until his wife Emma died in 1955 that Jung realized that, that there was one aspect that was missing, the, the personality of himself had never really been expressed. He says, to put it in the language of the Bollingen house, I suddenly realized that the small central section which couched so low, so hidden, was myself. I could no longer hide myself between, behind the maternal and the spiritual. So in that year, he added an upper story to the section, which represented, so this is what he's saying. I added an upper story to this section, which represented myself. Um, or my ego personality. With that, the building was complete. So you see the central section, which is Jung's so back to our tour with Jost Harney. As we left the kitchen, he brought us to a small courtyard framed by the original tower. And on the other side, there was a woodshed still packed as neatly as during Jost's time. And in front of us, the lake. And all together formed an intimate space where Jung did much of his stone work, his own stone work. As we sat down, Jost, Jost began, began saying with a twinkle in his eye that the rumor has it that Jung built the entire tower by himself, but the fact is that he had local workers helping with the labor, and perhaps Jung brought some of the stones in his same boat, and most of them are probably shipped on a much sturdier ship. As we were talking, the sense of timelessness came over me again, of something eternal, sitting next to the tower, looking out over the lake, while on the other side there was the famous cornerstone, where Jung had carved what the tower meant to him. And you can see two of the sides of the tower. Josh, Josh told us that it was supposed to have been a much smaller triangular space, <coughs> part of the wall for the outer uh, courtyard. And he had even been present when they took the measurements and so he knew they had all the information. But when the stone arrived, it was a big square shoe. And there was a lot of a upheaval that the Mason wanted to send it back. And when, when you saw the stone, he said, no, this is my stone. I have to have it. And the first he chiseled into the stone was a quote by, on, in Latin by an alchemist here in translation. Here stands the, the mean, uncomely stone, the very Cheap, it is very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise. I read it again. Here stands the mean, uncomely stone. It is very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise.
Soon something else appeared on it on another side of the stone, and I just loved it. He sort of let the images emerge out of the stone, like the Leonardo da Vinci, so the stones spoke to me. Uh, and this um, well-known image came from, it began first as a circle, and then there was this little figure inside the circle, uh, and he started to think of it as an eye, and that the little figure is the tribute, that we see our own image in the other person's eye. So, and that he wrote about that in many books later, in many places. He called it also the pointer of the way. Um, Jung continued to add images and words, but he left the fourth side empty, which I find quite moving. Uh, he, he had thought about um, calling it the cry to Marie, the cry of Marie, um, which um, is, you can hear in the forest and um, sometimes, but it has, which he felt was the work of Achilles and symbolized the work of Achilles and also his own work. But it probably was, you couldn't carved that down into stone at that time. Um, <coughs> as you probably know, there had been a special connection with stone throughout Jung's life. In his early childhood, there was a large stone that he would sit on uh, and play a game, wondering whether he was the boy sitting on the stone or he was the stone on which the boy was sitting on. And of course, these all were very well-known stories, but I think they are really, really described his beautiful stones. And of course, when he broke up with Freud, he sat down by the lake and played with pebbles and made a little village and tower, a uh, castle. Uh, and of course, for so many years, he studied this book and wrote about the lapis, the stone of uh, the alchemist. And when he did in so doing, he connected with or reached back to the earliest time of humankind, the time we call the Stone Age. Um, the time when the revolutionary insight was first made of turning stone into symbol. And it was this that made us human to be able to think symbolically. <coughs> and Jung's entire life and work is an expression of this. I think it is a, it's a coincidence. I think it's no coincidence that the most popular of all book, Jung's books, I think, was called The Man and His Emotions. We even have it in Swedish. I just want to return for a moment to Jung's story <coughs> of simplicity. As he cooked his food over the fire and brought in water from the well, as he wanted to and also live in harmony with nature, by reading a poem that for me evokes Jung's life at the tower and his dream of a simple life. A poem that also includes the shadow side of suffering and struggles. Or to uh, use the words from the poem, when the world in its great mystery was hidden by the stream. It was written by the poet and farmer, Wendell Berry, who loved his land as much as well. <laughs> One day I walked imagining what work I might do here, the place once dark and made clear by work and thought my managing, the world thus made more dear. I walked and dreamed, the sun in clouds, dreamer and day at once. The world in its great mystery was hidden by my dream. Today I may complain. I dream of what is here beside the falling stream, the stone, the light upon the stone, and day and dream are one. I read the last poem. The world in its great mystery was hidden by my dream. Today I make no claim, I dream of what is here. 
beside the falling stream, the stone, the light upon the stone, and day and dream are one. Close to the end of his life, Jung had uh, several dreams about stones, and I'll tell you one of them. Um, he dreamt that he was high up on a mountain where he saw a stone below, below bathed in light, sunlight, and uh, much like the stone in Wendell's poem, Wendell Berry's poem. And maybe like the stone he had been sitting on as a child. Carved in the stone were the, the following words. Take this as a sign of the wholeness you have achieved and the singleness you have become. For in the words of the poem, I dream of what is here, beside the falling stream, the stone, the light within the stone, and the day and dream of one. Thank you.